Good afternoon, my friends. This is the Grim Flayer. Hope you're all doing very well today, and I am here to bring you the heat once again, to light them up once again, to bring you the flames, to bring you the fire. That's right, we are playing Mono Red Prowess again in Modern for your enjoyment on this channel. Hot on the heels, as promised, of the previous Red Prowess video. Now, this is another replay, as I explained in the previous video. I have been, kind of been playing this deck off camera. It's like the one I've been playing to cool off to change the uh, bit of a change of pace from the usual mid range stuff, right? So if you want to see me play more of this, and if you want to see me play it live, you know what to do. Give me those comments. Uh, high view count here, and I will be very, very happy to bring you this deck more often. If I can get the views of the prowess stuff up near the mid range stuff, and I'll be playing it more and more because, guys, I. Love this deck. I think it's awesome. Might just be the most underrated deck in modern, if you ask me. So, a couple quick changes to the list from what you've seen me play the last few times out on the channel. We have shaved one copy of Warlord's Fury. I was previously on the third one. And we are trying the fourth copy of Bedlam Reveler. This is a card that is very, very powerful. It is the single card you wish to draw the most um, a whole lot of the time in a whole lot of matchups, right? However, it is also the clunkiest in multiples by definition, and it is also a little bit clunky in general early on when you just want to go fast. So for that reason, I think three is viable. It's possible that three is even optimal, but a lot of successful lists play the full four. Owe it to ourselves to try that out for sure. Um, other changes, I just kind of even though a braid I think is an all-star of the sideboards right now and probably in general I have trimmed a braid number three in favor of dismember number two just to be able to flex into the matchups where they play Tarmogoyf or Shadow against us or a Gurmag Angler. You gotta kill the fatty sometimes. Dismember is our real our only realistic way to do that. It's not a non-bow with the rest of our deck. And finally we are Shaving a Shrine of Burning Rage, which is a card I am pretty happy with, just to try a Pithing Needle, you know. Generally speaking, I am amenable to the charms of Pithing Needle. I'm very much in favor of this card in a vacuum. I like it a lot. But I don't historically think it's a good fit in my decks. I don't think it's like a classic BGX mid-range card. Nor do I think it's really a classic prowess card. Uh, just the static hate piece, not the most synergistic with our plan. On the other hand, it does trigger prowess, so it's not a total non-bow or a total outlier. That said, I'm still not sure how I feel about it, but we did run it out as a one of for the sake of experimentation this league. So let's do it. Let's jump right into a league. Before we do, just want to show you again, brianpalmerart.com, the channel's first official sponsor. Very exciting times. Grimflayer MTG is the discount code to get 10% off of Brian's magnificent artwork, tokens, playmats, alterations, custom uh, commissions, and much more. You can find the links and all the relevant info in the description. Thank you so much. I truly mean this. Thank you so much to all Patreon supporters who do make this content possible and support and sustain it. Now let's light them up. Let's play some Mono Red Prowess. All right, guys, we're kicking it off with a strong one lander, but a one lander nevertheless, but it has a one drop threat. It has a cantrip to give us a higher chance of hitting the second land, a one mana cantrip, that is, and it's a very strong blind game one hand overall. So even though there's always an inherent risk to the one lander, we do keep it. Opponent's going to lead off on Watery Grave, stick your supplier, they're going to mill Glimpse the Unthinkable, which is, of course, self-mill for this deck, and Prized Amalgam, so a little bit of a payoff in the yard already. Speaking of payoffs, we top deck the second land immediately, and we're going to go ahead and attack. We've got to attack through that Stitcher Supplier, it seems, this game anyway. Um, so we might as well do it while they're only blocking one point of damage. Of course, the big downside is that we give them the, uh, the Death Trigger right away, so they find another prized amalgam off of that. Definitely a little bit of a risky maneuver, but with our hand, specifically game one, we don't obviously have any graveyard hate. And we've got Kiln Fiend in the opener. I judged it necessary to just go all in with the race, you know. Uh, definitely not playing scared here. So Hedron Crab is their play. Milling, two, uh, milling twice, getting two triggers. Vengevine is in the yard. 
Another cast of Stitcher Supplier is going to return Vengevine. They're also going to hit Narc Amoeba and Creeping Chill. We've got the delay trigger off of the Amalgam. So, yeah, safe to say they're doing it. Safe to say they're going off. Look at that board state. Turn two on the play. Plus, they cast a free Lightning Helix to the Dome. Pretty rough stuff. What's our play? Well, here's our play. Kiln Fiend and Pass. Doesn't look very impressive, does it? But this is our very best way to try to engineer a turn three kill. And it also gives us a secondary blocker if we do need to block to stay alive. But of course, we're really going to want to not do that. Opponent's still going off another couple amalgams in the yard off the uh, Hedron Crab landfall triggers. Gravecrawler and Narcomoeba out of hand. And here come the beats. So opponent turning... Just about everything sideways, leaving back just a crab and a sticker supplier, getting the amalgams back, and putting us down to two. So, hey, that's the good news. We didn't have to chump block with our Swifty, right? So we're at two. Can we engineer lethal on the crackback? We're certainly not going to survive if we don't. So uh, the good news for us is Monomorphos with a couple things on the board, including a Kiln Fiend, is pretty great. We find Forked Bolt. Now, Forked Bolt... Turns out to be a pretty amazing draw here. We get to clear out two two blockers with one spell for one mana. You can't hate that, right? So, boom, tag the Narcomoeba, tag the Supplier. Uh, nothing relevant in the yard. We definitely wanted to fade Creeping Chill. Um, that's of no consequence what they found. So, here the, uh, the race plan goes on. So, we Lava Dart the Crab. We flash back. We Lava Dart the Crab again. We got a nice big board, and Lava Spike is actually going to finish them off. So opponents at 16, and we swing for 22. So we put the opponent to negative 6 on turn 3 after they gain 3 life. Yeah, Kiln Fiend a little bit OP, you have to say. When you're in race mode, there's nothing better than Kiln Fiend on curve, followed up by gas. And hey, Swifty into Kiln Fiend. Also very, very good. So Forked Bolt and Lava Dart allowing us to spread the damage in the exact optimal way to take care of a lot of X1 and X2 blockers. Kiln Fiend, Lava Spike, of course, Monomorphos, always the best card in terms of enabling big, big turns like this. And we stole one, guys. Getting a, getting a win game one against a super linear deck like Crabvine, definitely not always easy, especially when they have a nut draw like that on the play. But you know what? Kiln Fiend is a little bit of a nut draw of our own when backed up by that gas. Great stuff. Let's check out game two. And here we are for the second game, my friends. Sideboarding, I suppose, simple enough in that the Grave Hate comes in. So that would be one Tormod Script and two Surgical Extraction in my current build. Um, you know, I think you want to trim around the edges a little bit. I think you want to cut one of the grindy cards. I tend to cut the fourth Reveler over the fourth Light Up the Stage if I'm on four each. Um, and then, of course, just trimming around the edges. I think cutting either Warlord's Fury or Lava Spike is fine. But since we really are trying to all out race, I did opt to leave the spikes in over the Furies, probably a little bit quicker clock overall. Um, even though the cantrips certainly facilitate our clock in their own way in this deck. Opponent will take a mulligan. They're down to six. Looking for a more explosive start, and they found it. Merfolk Secret Keeper getting Vengevine and Prized Amalgam in the yard. Pretty good. Our opening hand was totally fine, and uh, we've drawn another land. So Monastery Swift Spear is the turn one play. And of course, ideally you want to Surgical while you're attacking, basically for maximum prowess damage. But here, they have two very high-impact... Uh, targets, plus they're on the play with more to come, so I felt pressured into holding back the Surgical for a more optimal moment. If they had, only, if they had hit like two Vengevines in there, then sure, maybe we Surgical for the prowess right there, but as it is, I felt obligated to hold this back, and sure enough, they have more gas. Crab into fetch land, just like in game one, so here come the landfall triggers. Nothing of consequence with the first three, but then they get two Narcomoebas here, and they've got two prized amalgams, so it's all a little bit scary. Uh, definitely a few different valid surgical targets here. Uh, prized amalgam is probably one of them. Uh, Narcomoeba could be one, and that's going to also maybe shut off prized amalgams, but they have other ways to get them back too. 
So, uh, you know, that's a little bit dicey. Now, Vengevine, of course, is the other option, and Vengevine represents the best, their best ability to race us. So I did opt, even though there's only one Vengevine in the yard, I did opt to Surgical the Vengevine. Also hoping maybe there is one in hand. Of course, there's not. Their hand is Bloodstained Mire. I almost said Bloodstained Amoeba. Not quite. Bloodstained Mire, Narc Amoeba. We take a quick look at their deck. Unsurprisingly, they, they don't have all that much to do besides bring in Fatal Pushes. I think that's about right against us for the average uh, Crab Vine build, but all the Venge Vines go bye-bye. They've still got a gigantic board, of course, but we have slowed them down a bit, staved them off a bit. The only other thing that really matters in their graveyard right now is Haunted Dead. Haunted Dead is a nice value play and also a discard enabler, so... There are some incentives to immediately get rid of this with Tormod's Crypt. Um, it's a, it's an interesting call, but I also think that with them still having uh, the ability to top deck more ways to fill the graveyard, there's an alternative of uh, of just playing it more uh, more cautious with Tormod's Crypt, especially because they have the Supplier Death Trigger coming. So we're just going race mode. Um, we bolt the crab to stop them from continually refilling, and we draw up the trigger, but there's still nothing else of consequence, so I did decide to hold back the crypt a little bit. Um, it's basically Swifty against the world right now, and uh, triple Narc Amoeba, double Amalgam, quite the board. But look at the opponent respecting us, because we killed them out of absolutely nowhere on turn three last game, so they decided to respect us again. And they're holding everything back. Now, yeah, I mean, maybe you're supposed to chip in with something there, at least even if you want to play cautiously. But you understand the opponent's skittishness, right? So it's back to us. Client lagging a bit, so let's just hit play here. Uh, we draw Fiery Islet. Still a little ways away from casting Bedlam Reveler. So there's really not a terribly large amount we can do here besides spike them. And pass, spiking them, of course, advancing the clock and getting us closer to Bedlam Reveler. And the opponent now perhaps sensing that we don't have quite so much uh, explosivity as we did in game one. They're going to turn their entire board sideways. Quite a difference from their attacks last turn, you must say. But clearly they have some other ways to clog up the ground. And it's Secret Keeper and a Grave Crawler, which doesn't quite block, but fair enough. So definitely some incentive at least to crack Fiery Islet here looking for more gas. Also some incentive to just untap. I did opt to just untap, and uh, that is a little bit better for facilitating Reveler, and we've drawn a Forked Bolt. Once again, Bolt doing uh, doing the Lord's work here, taking care of a couple Narc Amoebas. Definitely very helpful in terms of reducing their clock and reducing their ability to block us. And then it's Reveler time. We, uh, we hit a whole bunch of gasoline off the top. But for now, we just have to take this defensive stance. And uh, Reveler, of course, very conveniently outsizing the Amalgams. That's big game. And the opponent has top-decked Merfolk Secret Keeper, so they'll begin by casting Venture Deeper. And they finally hit something of relevance, Creeping Chill. There's also a Grave Crawler in there. So now's our time. Tormod's Crypt. Glad we slow-rolled it. Uh, Haunted Dead did not end up getting used, and we get to exile all that stuff before it does any damage. Opponent has also found a Fatal Push, though. Little bit scary, little bit scary. And then they are just going race mode, as they should here, you think. I uh, think that seems definitely like the way to go. So we get a nice block there with Reveler. They cast their 0-4. Then it's back to us, and once again, we kind of have to put Lethal together. Let's see if we can do it. So... Mountain, not very good. Soul Scar Mage, not the most relevant probably right now. So Lava Spike into Light Up the Stage is the clear path forward. And boy, oh boy, is that a path if I've ever seen one. Monomorphos, Lightning Bolt, a couple pretty good cards if you ask me. So Monomorphos, admittedly, not finding us the very most, the very best thing in another land. But we dig, and it's our good friend Forked Bolt. But hey, Lightning Bolt, also pretty nice here. But all we really do is control the board. We got a pass. So we didn't have lethal. They've got blockers. We didn't have uh, crash through active or anything like that that turn. And while we could be dead to any number of things, we are not dead on board. We block Gravecrawler. We only take one from Narcomy, but we are at two. So um, all that kind of 
no sound and fury signifying nothing, right? You know, we didn't really do much proactive that turn, but maybe we set ourselves up. We dug a little deeper. We we did some work. We did take care of the amalgam. They won't always get it back, and they didn't this time. They just top decked a Greenland. So good times for us. We are down to one. Can't crack the can't tap the islet. Excuse me for mana, but we can certainly crack it. Once again, Soul Scar, not the most proactive thing here, but since we are adopting that defensive posture, here's what we do. We take this we play a Soul Scar, we're gonna Forked Bolt. Definitely got a Forked Bolt in Archimeba, and uh, we get rid of the Grave Crawler that way too. Once again, a recursive threat, but since we're in race mode and they're out of gas, maybe just maybe it won't recur. Um, we gotta make them see the block there, assign it. If they don't, we have lethal with bolt. And they do, so instead we just play out a Soul Scar going nice and wide. So really hoping to fade a Creeping Chill. Hard Cast would kill us right now. And uh, the opponent is moving straight to attack, so nothing else looks like this turn. Client slowing down on us again, keeping us in suspense again. All right, back over to us. Guess we just got to hit play here. We've drawn Crash through. That's a beautiful draw. That is the draw we wanted to see. Kick it off with a cantrip. Lightning bolt in hand, looking for more gas. But unless the opponent has a removal spell, they might be in deep trouble, even if we don't find more gas. And we sure do. Crash through into Monomorphos, and the opponent just scoops there. They don't even need to see the bolt. Apparently they drew a brick, and that's going to do it. So, yeah, we had the trample, we had the, the power, and we had the wide board to really really close the deal so doesn't get much closer than this guys we uh we went to two in game one we killed them on the crack back out of nowhere thanks to kiln fiend and monomorphos and all the rest and then here in game three we disrupted a little bit more with uh surgical and tormod's crypt we had to control the board and play defense a little bit more but eventually the opponent ran out of stuff to do and we turned the corner just in time just in time forked bolt saving us at one life uh you gotta love it so great games here against crack Crab Vine, very close games. I think this is exactly what you're supposed to do. I think you want to race as hard as possible while disrupting as efficiently as possible on the way. Sounds obvious, but you know, it's it's uh, it's still the gameplay we need to execute. The game plan, rather. That we need to execute. We did so here. Let's go on to round two. All right, my friends, here we are. We've won the die roll. That's a beautiful thing. Haven't been doing that all that much lately. And the opponent took a mulligan. So... Uh, this is a definitely a borderline keep from us. You don't necessarily want to keep one landers that don't have either a one mana threat or light up the stage, preferably both. However, this has something else. This has the immense upside of being able to just do three proactive sorceries right away, and then if we hit the second land, we're going to have the Monomorphos chain into an early Bedlam Reveler. So that's a very, very high upside, admittedly a low floor on this hand as well. But with the opponent mulling, we're very happy to have kept a functional hand of our own, and we uh, we can trip into a creature, and then we f which is okay. But then we find a Bedlam Reveler, which is not very good. The second Rev, not really what we want to see, right? So, just gonna go, um, you know, try to play our stuff out. Hope the opponent doesn't crush us too badly. We don't know exactly what Wooded Foothill signifies, but Soul Scar Mage is the play here. Opponent getting the stomping ground on the end step. Verdant Catacombs into Swamp. So Jund and Forked Bolt is the play here. So let me slow down and explain that now that the client's not lagging as much. Um, we already had a sorcery in the yard. Goyf was a 2-3. If we bolt the Goyf, it's going to become a 3-4. So it is shrinking the Goyf just as much to simply Forked Bolt it and then attack. And that's exactly what we're going to do. This kind of neuters Goyf for the rest of the game, and it also let, let us push some good damage through there. So that's better than going upstairs with a Forked Bolt, in my view. And then it is back to us. And Monomorphos time. We're going off. We're going off. We're hitting the land drops, and we find Lightning... Um, I think we already had that Lightning Bolt, but we find a Lava Dart. We find another Mountain. Uh, bolt will finish off, Goyf, Lava Spike will go upstairs, and we're going to smash the opponent for five, and they've got nothing to say about it. Plus, we have filled our yard nice and full for Mr. Reveler. So, 
back to the OP. Let's see what they can put together. It's a Coligan's command, and it's a really good one. They catch us tapped out, so they kill our thing cleanly, and they buy back Goyf. They play a fourth land, so that's a very good turn for them. But we have the Reveler plan, and we've also drawn Swifty, which I do like more than getting the one damage out of Lava Dart. We still get the back half of Dart out of the graveyard, and we've drawn plenty more gas in the hand. Land number four... Creature number three and another Lava Dart. Yes, please. Sounds pretty great to me. So, opponent, they're fetching. And so, they've clearly got a good turn ahead Tarmogoyf, which we knew about. Scavenging Ooze, which we did not know about. But they do not have another Greenland, so that's just kind of a grizzly bear at the moment. They're representing Lightning Bolt or Fatal Push with two cards in hand. So, we draw Soul Scar Mage. We're clearly just dumping out our whole hand here. Might as well play Soul Scar first, just in case the minus uh, the minus counters matter. But we're gonna try to kill the Grizzly Bear before it untaps, which we can do with or without Soul Scar's ability. And then we've got a nice huge board, and we're turning them all sideways. Any two connecting here is going to be lethal, and the opponent just scoops. We had that extra Lava Dart for a little bit more gas to push us over the line or to strength the Goyf, is, as the case may be, depending on what else they had and how they blocked, right? But didn't need it. Opponent seemed to not have a one mana piece of interaction in hand, and that was that. So uh, the Jund player mulling to five, admittedly very good for us. The BGX decks, as I can tell you firsthand, do not like to mulligan that low, especially in game ones. And we were able to, you know, kind of leverage our slow but value-rich hand relative to the averages of, of prowess to uh, to kind of outgrind the opponent, which is basically what we did. Like, when you trade off and then land a reveler, you've basically outground the opponent. So even though we were pressuring their life total the entire time, even though we did have a somewhat quick kill of turn six considering the disruption we faced uh we still also competed very well on the value access never really gave them the luxury of starting to take over the game with one of their recurring value pieces because we were right there competing on all fronts at all times and that's uh that's the idea so good to win game one against a relatively tough matchup in jund let's check out game number two all right, my friends, so you may have seen me attempt a Blood Moon in one game out the other last league against Jund. Um, kind of off that plan at the moment. I, again, I, I could see trying to cheese them out with one, but they're incentivized to fetch basics anyway. Ren and Six is a thing, so um, yeah, kind of borderline on that. So since I'm not sure, I err on the side of sticking to the game plan, facilitating the actual win condition of building up big threats and killing the opponent. So how we have sided is one Shrine of Burning Rage and two Dismembers in, and trimming around the edges, the Kiln Fiend, pretty poor against all of their uh, Jund removal, and Attrition in general, and trimming away one Forked Bolt and one Lava Spike. Uh, if they show me Hex Drinker and or Dark Confidant, I'll take out another Spike instead of the Bolt. Since they haven't, I kind of hedged taking away one of each. Those are two of our weaker cards in the matchup uh, relative to what stays in. Opponent has kept seven this time, and our opening hand is a little bit loose, but then again, Mulling is also pretty loose uh, in this matchup, so it's kind of kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. You just basically hope to keep a hand that is decent and draw well, and we've drawn pretty well with Bedlam Reveler right off the top. Now they can thought seize it, perhaps, but... The uh, the fact is, that's one of our very best cards in the matchup. So, um, for, okay, let me pause here. Forked Bolt is definitely something that, as I said, one of the weaker cards in the matchup, you could very easily say we should just fire it off. Turn one, because it's mana efficient, because it is the... Um, it is a way to fill fuel Bedlam Reveler, get to him earlier, and it's also not going to be that great against a whole lot of what they're doing. But the fact that they didn't do anything turn one, not even play a fetch land, that made me want to slow roll it, because that means if they didn't cycle this Baron more on the end step, if they just played land Tarmogoyf, Forked Bolt could have killed it. If they play Scoos on Curve, or if they're on something like Bob, it can kill a lot of their stuff. So I did decide 
to slow roll it just in case. Unfortunately, they do cycle more and then play the Goyf, so Forked Bolt can no longer kill it. It will become a 2-3 before it resolves. However, we drew light at the stage, very, very good draw, so that was uh, that rewarded us for hanging onto the fork bolt. We just get to shock him and then light it up, and that's exactly what we do. Mountain Lava Dart over there in exile, awaiting our, waiting our attentions, and they have Liliana. So, Goyf into Liliana, the classic BGX curve out. Uh, we're on the receiving end of it. And then it's back to us, and we draw a second Bedlam Reveler, so that's a little bit rough. At least it's kind of a free pitch to Lily if that's what we end up needing to do, but we're certainly going to play that land from Exile, and we're certainly going to kick things off with a Monomorpho, see what we can see. Um, just got to dig for action, got to dig toward Reveler. And we find a couple Lightning Bolts. So I think the thing to do here is to start taking care of their board. Tarmogoyf is a really hard card for us to beat, uh... It is very good at blocking our stuff and very good at racing us if there's nothing for them to block. Therefore, I do just commit to taking care of absolutely everything. We are going to bolt the goif and then dart the goif, and then we're going to bolt the lily. And we I was actually tempted to leave the lily here as well, because again, we have that free pitch with Bedlam Reveler. But then the problem is, she's at two, we don't have a clean way to kill her, she's going to edict the Reveler that we do play. So, all things considered, I just said, let's just trade off. We're just trading off all resources. And then the opponent rips an Inquisition of Kozilek for turn, or maybe they had it last turn, played Liliana over it. Either way, it whiffs. They play a land, they pass, and another land, not the greatest draw, but hey, whatever. We're resolving Bedlam Reveler against Jund. That's very good. Uh, some very powerful cards in hand, but nothing particularly useful at the moment. But opponent is a little bit flooded, perhaps. They play a land, and then they hard cast Leyline of the Void. Okay, you know, don't particularly mind that. We've The damage has already been done, right? So, kick things off, as always, when you're uncontested like this with good old Monomorphos. Then it's Swifty time, and then we actually get to main phase, light up the stage, which I do like a little bit better here than attacking first. Um, I just want to get as much damage across as possible. This was a super efficient way to do exactly that. And the opponent is actually just facing lethal on board with this Lava Dart waiting in the wing. So if they don't have any removal, which they don't seem to, that's going to do it. And they scoop it up. So there we go. There we go. There we go. Taking down Jund 2-0 definitely can be a much tougher matchup than what we saw here. But hey, you know, the opponent on the play had a, a goif that we couldn't one for one into Liliana. That's some good stuff. But, you know, a lot of their other stuff was lacking. They didn't really show us removal. They didn't have a turn one play, you know, no turn one Inquisition. Their turn four Inquisition whiffed. Their ley line came down after the fact rather than in their opening hand. So some things definitely did go our way. But you see, you see the power of our deck. You see the power of our deck to grind. Even if it hadn't gone quite so smoothly, the onus would really be on the opponent to find a source of recurring life gain that they can stick, like a scavenging ooze. Otherwise, you know, we're still all the way up at 17. We've got plenty of time to draw more gas, to draw more burn, and just finish him off. So, um, this is a matchup where the fourth Reveler is definitely good, but at the same time, you saw the double Reveler be clunky, uh, for sure. That's just one reason I have been playing three historically, but hey, maybe it's the cost of doing business, and Reveler was definitely key to our victory here in Game 2. Uh, League's off to a great start. Let's move on to Round 3. All right, everyone, we've got a sweet one. This is the exact type of hand that you love to see. Two lands, two early threats, light up the stage, Lava Spike, Monomorphos. Doesn't get too, too much better than this now, does it? Plus, we're on the play, and the opponent is mulliganed to six. Lots of things uh, look like they're going our way at the moment, but you never know. You never know how it's going to go. Opponent goes Spire Bluff Canal and Pass, typically a Storm card. That is what... I'm uh, looking for, even though Faithless Looting has been banned for many months, a part of my, me still says it's either Storm or Phoenix, but <laughs> it's not Phoenix, not anymore. So we're going for the light up the stage plan. We just smack him for two, a tame two damage, but light up the stage is going to set us up for a great turn three, we hope. Mountain and Forked Bolt, yeah, that's fine. You know, nothing spectacular, but nothing too bad either. Opponent will opt on the end step. 
They go bottom with the op, they resolve sleight of hand, and then nothing. So opponent with kind of a risky one lander keep, but on the draw with a couple cantrips in hand, you'd think they'd hit the second land, but they don't. They don't, and that's great for us, you know? We're not mad about it, are we? So land from exile into Monomorphos, into Bedlam Reveler. That's a pretty fine find overall, giving us some top end to work toward. It's not the uh, the lethal we were maybe hoping to put together here for turn three, but we do get to uh, put them all the way down to five and cast Reveler next turn, so that's pretty good if we have nothing better to do. Opponent with another sleight of hand finally finding the other land, but we draw Lava Dart. That's pretty good. That's just straight up lethal. You know, they don't... Have, they, Post uh, pre-side, what can they have? They don't have lightning bolts in their deck. They don't have one mana counter magic. Even if they do, we get to flashback Lava Dart. That's just got them. We just got them on turn four. No problem with the big bad Bedlam Reveler. Still in hand. Still in hand. So kind of a free win here, game one against Storm. But hey, that's the power of our deck. We could have ground them out if we needed to. We could have controlled the board with Fork Bolt a little bit if we needed to. But because we don't need to... All that stuff advances our clock, and that's what we did, and we really took it to him. So, nice uh, way to punish the Storm player stumbling over a one-land keep, and let's check out game two. All right, guys, so we're on the draw here for game two. Um, I sideboarded like this. We brought in two copies of a braid, but not the dismembers, thinking we only want so many reactive removal spells in hand. We we want a critical mass of things that can go to face because we do want to race and we can in theory lose to them without a mana bear. And we also brought in two copies of Surgical Extraction, but not the Tormod script. Again, kind of hedging, thinking, you know, what's what's the most proactive, what's the best way to disrupt them while racing them. I don't know that this is correct. I really don't know that this is correct. More on this at the end of this match. Um, we'll, we'll revisit it based on what we see. But this was my first time ever facing Storm. Never, I don't think ever faced it, not even in a practice game, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, not wasn't sure about everything, but we trimmed a couple Lava Spikes, a Forked Bolt, and a Kiln Fiend. Again, we'll review that sideboarding at the end of this match. But for now, let's play game two here. Opponent keeping seven. Go in Serum Visions to kick things off. Our hand is is pretty medium. It's it's like okay. Um, just doesn't have a one mana threat, but is otherwise pretty acceptable. Drawing the second Bedlam Reveler once again, we see that uh, that clunkiness kind of rearing its ugly head. But opponent goes Thing in the Ice, so there's Strike One against my sideboarding. Right, Thing is not something I'm used to seeing out of Storm. If I had thought about like if people if someone had sat me down and asked me, okay, think of all the cards that a Storm player could play in the sideboard. Thing in the Ice is something that I would have thought of, but I'm just so used to playing BGX, they never bring this in against me. Uh, if anything, they move away from creatures a little bit, not bringing in more of them, right? So, uh, Dismember clearly is better at answering Thing than a Braid is, so we might be a little bit soft to that, we'll have to see. But we do just go Lava Dart light up the stage, trying to keep digging for more action. We find Mountain, we find Lava Dart, fine cards, but are they what we're looking for? Maybe. We'll see. Opponent going land into Sleight of Hand into Goblin Electromancer. So we've got a thing with three counters on it, and we've got Goblin Electromancer as well, the good old-fashioned cost reducer. So Swifty was the draw for turn. Let's play our land from Exile. Let's play the Swifty. We do, after all, have to race. And then Monomorphos looking for the good stuff here, seeing what we can see. And we find another Monomorphos. Well, pretty fine with me. And then we find another mountain. So our our turn has kind of petered out here. We were maybe hoping for another one mana spell that we could cast alongside Lava Dart to control the board. Maybe like going bolts into Dart or something like this. But we do get to a braid here. And then we are forced to cash in a mountain to achieve exactly that. And we're also leaving their cost reducer up, but I think that's pretty fine because Thing in the Ice is a card that can really beat us anyway. I mean, it's certainly not great, and we also lost the Lava Dart from Exile, so a little subpar in a couple different ways. But, um, you know, the opponent is liable to hit their fourth land drop anyway. It's questionable 
you know, I think it'd be pretty loose to leave the thing around. Let's just put it that way. But opponent just is going to bolt our board, smack us for two. Doesn't really go off this turn, and we're just drawing kind of badly overall, you know. Just the revelers and mountains in hands in hand, rather, not the very best. And we cannot even cast Reveler this turn because we did cash in Lava Dart last turn. So we're really giving the opponent a wide open window, but fortunately they don't seem to have anything, really. They play an Opt, they attack, and they play another Electromancer. So clearly they lack Gifts Ungiven, they lack the payoffs. And uh, we're just drawing more Mountains, so we just cast a Bedlam Reveler for four. And we draw Mountain Reveler. Reveler, oh, it's so bad. It's so bad. The four Reveler plan looking absolutely awful right now. I don't know if one of the Revelers is also something we could consider cutting. Maybe we're supposed to play at Braids and Dismembers, and in that case, I could see cutting a Rev. Uh, please, my friends, let me know what you think about the sideboarding in this matchup. Opponent has another thing in the ice, but still no payoff, so I guess both decks kind of failing to fire here, right? We're going to go upstairs with a Lava Spike. Pretty good draw, you know, anything that's not a land or another Bedlam Reveler, which I guess we don't have any left in the deck, was a good draw there. So, Spike, sure. And we play another Rev. Now we've got some goods, right? Now we got Swifty, Surgical, Lava Spike. Um, it's always worth taking a moment and considering, do we want a Surgical anything? Is there anything in their graveyard that we really want to fade? It is not the worst idea, given how many payoffs they have, um potentially to draw to, to like surgical a sorcery speed cantrip on their draw step. Just something to keep in mind, but you can also definitely afford to play a little bit more reactively here, and uh, that's ultimately what we do decide to do for this turn. Just play the Swifty setup for a good turn next turn. We can even surgical just for prowess this way. So once again, we gotta fade their draw step. They hit a monomorpho, so here's where we wonder, are they finally gonna chain things together? And they don't, they just scoop instead. So, obviously not dead dead on board, but I'm sure the opponent was pretty frustrated here. We gave them such a large window to just go off uncontested. We didn't manage to kill their 2-2, which is pretty unusual. Again, both decks kind of failing to fire here, but hey, we had the Revelers, they didn't. Like, if you draw this many cards, you're eventually going to put together... Some kind of lethal, even though it's kind of a stumbling one. And we, I mean, we didn't necessarily have lethal next turn, but depending on what we drew, we're probably pricing them into some kind of bad chump block and then taking it from there. So whatever, you know, opponent just has seen enough. We'll take it. We'll take it. So not a vintage performance by any means from Prowess, but the proactive nature of our deck, the high floor of a lot of our cards, means that we did get over the line anyway. Another 2-0, taken down Storm. You'll love to see it. And here we are for the fourth round, my friends. I do hope you're enjoying this replay through the uh, the fire and the flames, as it were. And uh, you know we've got we've got like a respectable one land keep. It's got a lot of what you want out of a one lander. Uh, Fiery Islet always awkward when it's your only land, but hey, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? So opponent with the Street Wraith into Fetch Shock into Thoughtseize plan. Uh, pretty clear indication of some kind of a shadow deck. A lot of them are four color now for Oko, in addition to the green, st all the broken green cards going around right now, and uh, Tarmogoyf seeing a lot of play in some of those variants as well. So they took away our Lightning Bolt, just uh, taking away the most flexible card, the most damage on one card perhaps, and uh, leaving our creature so they think they can deal with it in some way, shape, or form. And it is Death Shadow backed up by a watery grave, so they're representing all manner of things, you know, fatal push, stubborn denial, you name it, and uh, we do hit the second land, that's really what we needed, that's really what we wanted to see, Monomorphos is the play, so we've got a bunch of interesting options in hand, Fort Bolts, Crash Throughs, Lava Darts, um, I do decide, though, that we just kind of have to try to take care of the board. So Fort Bolt resolves. I'm so happy to two for one myself if it actually gets Shadow off the field. So that's our plan of attack. And, uh, you know, we're thinking that it's not super likely that the opponent has another Street Wraith. There's only four in the deck. They already used one. But this wasn't necessarily on my radar, and they have Dismember in response. That's a huge blowout. So we just wasted some burn on the Shadow, and they get to kill our thing. 
pretty rough stuff, not gonna lie. On the other hand, the opponent is down to six. They are in range where we can maybe cheese them out, and that's kind of our that's kind of our plan now, isn't it? So anyway, opponent's gonna smack us for seven. They play a basic land, which puts our uh, puts our hopes and dreams on the back burner maybe a little bit more. And then they play a Gurmag Angler. That's a little bit rough. So we started off with a Fort Bolt. Fort Bolt into light up the stage. And we find Monastery Swift Spear. I think that's a pretty good one. We, uh, we definitely just want to play it. And right now, technically, technically, we are not dead. Um... They gotta have removal, or they gotta have a way to grow the shadow. Um, or, sorry, not grow the shadow, because we'll be blocking it either way. But, they have removal, they just have fatal push. So, we uh, take 14, and we're dead. Um, yeah, so, I think the last league that I showed you, the previous one on this channel, I believe it's league number 3, is the like the first league I've basically ever played <laughs> um, on or off camera without running into Shadow. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Shadow. I think Shadow is a sweet deck. I think it's a sign of a healthy meta when it's on top. But I really... It's, it's like cool as a change of pace to play against Shadow when you're on Prowess. It's like different. But I don't want to see it every single league, really. It's just kind of like... Feels like it's out of my hands in a lot of ways. And I think pretty good example of that here in game one like you just kind of have to go for stuff and sometimes your plan really works against you what are you gonna do so anyway if you disagree you can let me know what your thoughts are but otherwise we take an l we take an l at the hands of shadow see you for around uh, for, excuse me for game two Okay, on the play against Shadow, looks like Sultai Shadow, uh, from what we saw, as I recall, and I'm kind of off the moon plan against these decks, just basically going with the value stuff, the, uh, the good answers, the good threats, basically, and, uh, Shrine of Burning Rage is basically a threat, so we brought in Shrine of Burning Rage, we brought in two dismembers, we take away Kiln Fiend, and we take away a pair of Forked Bolts, I like retaining Lava Spikes here, because... Cheesing them out, you know, going upstairs as hard as possible when they do dip their own life total, though, is a good, uh, it's a good win condition, right? So, a, uh, kind of like reminiscent of our hand against Jund, this is one's a little bit better, but still it's kind of a medium hand, but one you don't want to mulligan against the discard deck. Speaking of which, Inquisition taking away light up the stage, that was the biggest thing we had going for us, is turn two spike into light up. Uh, we don't have it, so instead the question is, do we just hold fast and try to draw a threat and then go off, or do we try to dig right now with Monomorphos? You can see kind of doing either, but I chose to dig with Monomorphos, and Swiss Spear is a reward for doing so, and it is also an incentive to just shove here. So we just spike him and we crack in for two. Yes, it's going to turn on a shadow earlier, but hey, you know, that's again kind of the direction in which our hand is pulling us. I think we're supposed to follow that cue. So, back to us. Drawing another mountain, not great, is it? Not great at all, but Monomorphos is our friend. Let's see what it yields. And we do have Bedlam Reveler. Now, it's just worth pointing out that you can make black mono with Monomorphos if you know you're definitely dismembering no matter what. It's a way to make it cheaper, uh, make it cost less. But, of course, we could have drawn other things, so I just made red. But just something that's worth pointing out. It could come up. Maybe relevant mostly against Burn or the Mirror. But anyway, uh, not sure Dismember will be in in those matchups anyway, so who knows. Uh, just something that's a curiosity more than anything. But the important thing here is that our Dismember takes care of the Shadow. We hit him for three, and the opponent didn't have anything else to do. They've got Inquisition, Inquisition whiffs, but notably they used Peatland with it, which means, sure enough, another Shadow coming down the pipe. So we draw light up the stage. A little bit awkward alongside Reveler. Again, I've mentioned this before, there are two grindy cards, but they don't necessarily play well together a lot when they're both in the same hand. And then we draw kind of a super dirtily three, double Fiery Islet, and light up the stage. Not really what we want to see. They'll bobble targeting us, but then it's nothing else too crazy. No attacks and no other plays. So opponent with four cards in hand, still on two lands. We draw a Lightning Bolt. You know, at this stage, Lightning Bolt, pretty good. So we're going to try to Bolt. Uh, obviously going to put them in the danger zone, and it's also going to turn on Light Up. Opponent has the Stubby D, Stubby D as expected, 
if they didn't do much else, we kind of expected that. But we had to try, and also we do get to resolve light up the stage now. And Lightning Bolt, Monastery, Swift Spear are the finds, so that's going to allow us to move two attacks. We've got the threat of Lightning Bolt hanging over their heads. They assign a block, and then we're basically just going to let damage resolve, because, of course, if we bolt them before that, uh, Shadow is going to get bigger, and we don't want to get blown out by a removal spell on Swifty. And also... That's just the, the safe thing to do. We don't want to let Shadow trade up with us in combat by any means. And also could die on the crackback more easily, too, if that happens, because um, we'd be tapped out without a blocker. So for those reasons, we do deploy Swifty. Unfortunately, they have pushed for our blocker, and uh, but do they have lethal? They do not. They just have a Gurmag Angler to block, and they smash us for nine with a big old shadow but we have warlord's fury and we also just have lightning bolt waiting in the wings so i guess they're just kind of dead anyway aren't they but the opponent sequenced that way played it out anyway whatever we'll take it right we'll take it we take him down with a healthy amount of overkill there reveler and swift spear showing them the business but it's always a close thing, you know, with when their things are so large relative to the mana cost, they're usually paying only one mana for Angler, always only paying one for Shadow, and there's such a tightrope to walk between uh, them being in the sweet spot where they're just curving out and, and clocking us and interacting well versus being in the danger zone. It is, as I said in game one, kind of an interesting dance. It's just like, okay, really, every league with this deck? But, hey, this was a pretty good example of... of like I said, I think you kind of have to follow the cues of your own hand. You can go in with a game plan saying, well, I'd prefer to hold my stuff and to not turn on Shadow too early, but sometimes you just kind of have to go for it. It's basically what we did here, and we got over the line, but it really could have gone the other way. Maybe if they'd had a third land drop, it would not have gone in our favor. In any case, we do get there. We do manage to take them to game three. Okay, my friends, so we have kept a seven that needs some help, but it's a very, very powerful seven if we get the help in the form of that second land and or a creature that can stick. Um, this is a hand that we can probably say we can safely accumulate our resources, even in the face of discard, right? They take away our two for one with a turn one thought seize. Bobble will resolve, and then it's back to us, and we draw a creature, so that's the play. Definitely the play there. Opponent going thought scour, looking for a second land, and they don't have it. So opponent kept a one lander, hasn't drawn the second one quite yet. Uh, which would be great, except neither have we. So at this point, I'm just saying, look, let's just progress the clock here a little bit. Putting them to 12, if all they can do is play Shadow and say go, there is no way they're sandbagging a Street Wraith to blow out our removal. They would have already cycled it in search of a second land. Of that, you can be assured. So, like, I'm not, not that scared of turning on the Shadow yet, because they kind of need uh, another land to really make it great. Um, at least in this particular window. So maybe they have one and they chose to play Inquisition instead. I could buy that. They take away Lightning Bolt because it's the only castable card in our hand and also because it's, it's the clock that they might be afraid of. But look at that. We hit our second land drop. That's what we needed, baby. Monomorphos time. Monomorphos number one yields SSM. Monomorphos two yields Lava Dart. So at this point, you could say play the Soul Scar. Maybe cast a Lava Dart, maybe not. Either way, setting up for a more explosive turn next turn. But we remember, we have that Bedlam Reveler in hand as well, so I'm kind of interested in just dumping out the hand as much as possible here. And that decision is extremely rewarded, because playing out yet another creature here is awesome. We still push through a lot of damage, and yes, again, we're playing with fire in regards to shadow, but unless they have, like, Swamp and a double shadow here, I don't think it's that punishing. And uh, they certainly do have a shadow, but still stuck on that one land. And that's not good news for them. Not good news at all. So you could uh, you could really just say that this is basically GG, no matter if we sequence a couple different ways, right? Because just going upstairs with this stuff, 
And uh, we can only cash in one lava dart because that is not a mountain fiery islet, but that's just overkill. It's just that we just have them. We just have them. So going wide, digging deep with Monomorphos allowed us to virtually guarantee lethal this turn simply by virtue of going wide again unless they had that second land. Opponent keeps the one lander, they do get stuck on it. Uh, we kept the one lander, we didn't get stuck on it. That's kind of the difference maker here. Now, granted, I think we're less likely to get stuck because we have more cantrips, right? But they certainly have some. They resolved one thought scour. Didn't help them find land number two. So, hey, tough matchup. It's a matchup that can go a variety of different ways. And sometimes the margins are so fine that players on either side of this matchup are inclined to keep hands with some element of risk to them. And uh, I think we saw that play out here. So we will take it. Shadow, a tough one to navigate. But we managed to get there. And we are 4-0, my friends, in this league. Another very, very successful league so far with Prowess. Let's see what we can do about round five. So here we go with the fifth and final round of this league. Now I've kept plenty of three-landers this league and some one-landers as well. This is a three-lander that I don't really want to keep. Double Bedlam Reveler is already basically a mulligan anyway. So in a blind game one, you know, we want we want the threat. We want the good early stuff. And, uh, you know, this is a lot more reasonable looking here. But you understand, I think, why we do mulligan that double Bedlam Reveler hand. Uh, we're on the draw. And this is a pretty sweet game one hand, you know, two lands, two threats, two lava darts, you gotta love it. But we see that turn one stitcher supplier yet again. So, definitely against a linear deck that kept seven on the play, you know, I don't know how to feel about it, but we go soul scar and we pass. They got another supplier. And let's take a moment to marvel at this. ETB mill three. Vengevine, Vengevine, and what's this? Squints? Yeah, that's another Vengevine. <laughs> you couldn't make it up. Triple Vine. And of course, do they lack the... Uh, do they lack the card? Do they lack the second creature? They sure don't. So triple Vengevine on the play on turn two. A little bit scary. We thought they had a nut draw in the initial time we faced Crabvine. I think this is a little bit worse. So it's back over to us. We take our draw step for turn two. I don't know what we could have. We'd probably have to hit all four Monomorphosi. And then still, I don't know if we could kill them. Probably not. But certainly can't kill them with our hand right here. Nor can we beat their board. So, running smack into the brick wall of Vines. Uh... Little bit of a misnomer there. I guess we're running into a wall comprised of vines. Better not mix our metaphors here, but like, unbelievable. Literally unbelievable. I think it's been a minute since I played the league. I think the opponent apologized in chat saying, sorry about that. Absolutely disgusting hit off sticker supplier, the disgusting nut draw. Hey, what are you going to do? We've had some great draws too with the deck. We, we have plenty of them, but man, oh man, that's about as rough as it gets. So they just crushed us. Game one, see if we can do a little bit better post-side. Okay, guys, here on the play for game two, sideboarding is the same as it was before. This is a, like, borderline one-lander, but it doesn't have a threat and it doesn't have any grave hate, so for that reason, I did decide to throw it back. This is a pretty poor hand. Like, yeah, crash through into Revelers is pretty good in attrition matchup, but we need to race and we need to disrupt the graveyard, so... I did decide to throw it back and look for some of that stuff at a, as a 5, and this is just kind of a super medium 5. Like, granted, it's a keepable functional one, but still no threat for the early game, still no graveyard. So I did decide to just bottom a spike, bottom a land, keep the second land. Part of me was tempted to just try to play on one, lands and, one land and hit the second one off crash through, right? The good news here, though, is the opponent is taking an even deeper mulligan, Goes all the way down to four. You love to see it. So crash through is the play into light up the stage. There we go. That's a way to unmulligan ourselves. So setting up the spike into light up turn two. Hopefully, opponent just has a grave crawler hard cast, and we draw surgical. So now we're talking a couple of real good ones off the top into light, uh, in the form of light up and surgical, and a good light up the stage with land plus threat. That's exactly the type of thing we like to see. 
Opponents got some action on their own side of the field, though. Crab into Paluta Delta, a familiar refrain this league, and they find Creeping Chill off of the Crab. Um, I don't know how good of a target Creeping Chill is in this deck for Surgical. Feels like a bit of a trap. Now, they did Mulligan, though, so it's reasonable to say maybe they're out of gas, maybe they won't gas out. We have the Bolt to kill Crab, maybe we take a decent... Um, a decent opportunity for it there, but I still decided not to. Still decided to wait for a different payoff. If they had hit two, I would have done it, right? But anyway, another mill doesn't find much that they want in there, but then they have Memory Sluice, some Mega Spice. They will conspire, and they will mill some more stuff. Uh, no Triple Vengevine this time. They hit a Narc Amoeba. Sure, I'm not going to extract that. A uh, part of, small part of me wishes I did, because then with the second, uh, <laughs> the Conspire, they hit another Narc Amoeba, but whatever. Uh, Narc Amoeba's a card we can beat, right? So, remaining disciplined with our Surgical, for better or for worse, and we do play the Swifty in the land out of Exile, and there's not a whole lot else that we're doing besides bolting the Crab, so we of course slow roll that, hope they get greedy and try to assign the double block, but wisely they just chump. And uh, we might as well just bolt the crab now, because we're not letting in them untap with it anyway. So, back to the opponent. They're sending the weenies in, going race mode. And then they've got nothing. And we draw light at the stage, which is a card that uh, is not usually the very best when we hard cast it. It's just not that efficient. But hey, it's, it's fine when both decks are kind of stumbling like this. It's totally fine. And once again, we find a mountain swifty in a clone of our previous light up. So that's the play. Sending these uh, haste prowess threats back at the OP. Opponent has been sandbagging this fetch land because they drew a Hedron Crab for a turn, just in case they did exactly this. So Crab's coming down, finding an Amalgam with the first trigger, finding Vengevine with the second. So... Some scarier things in the yard, but neither is coming back right now. And we draw Forked Bolt. Just the thing. Just what the doctor ordered. We want to take care of that crab. And we find another Swifty off of our cantrip. So that's the play, man. That's the play. Forked Bolt, your crab. Attack you for six. Always remember that extraction is plus three damage on a board like this. But because it's not lethal... I didn't choose to use it. I chose to remain disciplined with it. Gravecrawler coming back at us. And then the opponent will play Carrion Feeder. Second main phase, Carrion Feeder. Using the Gravecrawler, buying back Vengevine. The only way the sequencing kind of makes sense, I think, unless I'm missing something, is if they thought we had a Surgical in hand. Otherwise, I guess it makes it would make more sense to do this Gravecrawler carry and feeder loop main phase and attack with the Vengevine instead of the Gravecrawler, right? But anyway, maybe they uh, maybe they just plan to block with Vengevine anyway. Maybe that was kind of the the reasoning. So uh, that could be. In any case, uh, we see a Creeping Chill is their only card in hand. We get all the vines out of there, and then Prized Amalgam's coming back, but it's going to come back tapped. So carry and feeder doing its thing. And uh, it's, a, it's a powerful thing, but the opponent is hanging back, not chipping in with Narc Amoeba, and we just draw Soul Scar Mage for turn. It's not the worst, like it's not dead, but boy, did we really want to draw some way to like roast the board or just try to get lethal. But opponent finds Gravecrawler, and then it is uh, Swing for Lethal. So we've got to block two of these things, and that's how we block... Got a block carry and feeder for sure, and might as well trade off with Grave Crawler here. Use up a little bit more of their mana, whatever. Like they get to buy it back. I guess it's probably better than chumping. Um, anyway, but they didn't even. Yeah, sorry, never mind. I was gonna say they didn't make us trade off, but yes, they did. So here comes the carry and feeder Grave Crawler loop. Very nice value. And they only have one blocker, so if we just draw some kind of a miracle card, some kind of old-school card that was recently introduced into the modern format via Horizons, what could it be? I know what it is. It's Lava Dart. Lava Dart, I think, is the only one card that gets us out of this. Like, uh, Forked Bolt tagging Narcomy, but tagging them for one leaves us one shy. Uh, Monomorphos, of course, could find other cards, too. So Monomorphos could have done it, but... 
And maybe Bedlam Reveler into other cards could have done it too. But as far as one single card that gets it done, well, my friends, that would be Lava Dart. Lava Dart OP. We ping the Narc Amoeba, and they'll sack it for value, but that doesn't matter because they're dead. We ping them, and that's lethal by, uh, by plus one because Gravecrawlers cannot block. So whew, Skin of the Teeth victory there. Very, very cool game. Very close game. Didn't look all that promising for a while. Uh, neither deck was really operating on all cylinders because we both mulliganed pretty deep, right? But hey, we got there. We're taking him to game three. We're playing for that 5-0. and And here it is, the decisive game on the draw, and we've got a miserable hand. Forked Bolt, Monomorphos, five lands against a Crabvine deck. Not gonna do it. Gotta send it back once again. So... We've mulliganed every time this match, and we also have not found Graveyard Hate in our opening hands this match. Pretty rough stuff, um, but I am going to keep this for fear of going to, you know, an unplayable 5 or something. We have, like, exactly one Tormod script in the deck. It's not like mulling to Surgical is even something that they might really struggle that hard to beat. Like, we've got we've to do our thing, too. So, I did decide to keep this 6. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty fine 6 overall. And opponent has kept 7 with a turn 1 supplier milling Narcomoeba and Vengevine. Very nice start. Very nice start. And it is the land drop for us. The same card we bottomed is on the top. The Curse of the London Mulligan. But that could be fine. We just gotta hope they don't gas out too hard. Uh, we didn't have a good attack there, obviously. They double block it, they get the death trigger of Supplier, or they just lose Narcomy, but either way, it's not worth attacking. Um, but they have more gas. They have Hedron Crab in the land, but the mercy here is that they didn't have anything great in there, and they didn't have a second play for Vengevine. So there's a little bit of hope for us, but unfortunately, we draw another land. So... Time to dig with Monomorphos. We don't have much else going on in the hand that's amazing. Like, Forked Bolt and Crash Through is fine, but we gotta dig. We gotta dig. We gotta dig. Monomorphos, again, that's fine. And we find Lava Dart. So, sure, you know, a reasonable card. But let's Crash Through, and we're gonna plan to just Forked Bolt the Crab. Um, save our Lava Dart for... Maybe killing Narcomoeba, maybe finding another threat and having a really big turn. And we're coming across for five, but that's the rough thing. We really, really didn't want them to have another Fatal Push. They already milled one. Don't know how many they're playing, but yeah, that Fatal Push there was brutal. So they had the push, and they have a follow-up play of Crab into Crawler, buying back the Vine. Ugh, ugh, pretty rough. So they do kind of have everything... Just took them maybe in one turn more than average to get the Vengevine out. We draw light up the stage. Hey, you know what? That's a card. That's a card. It gives us a little bit of a window here. So started off with a Lava Dart, Trigger Spectacle, and we find a couple creatures off of it. You know, this is fine. This is fine. We do need more help off the top, though. That's for sure. So Soul Scar Mage, pass to the opponent. Hope they don't have anything too crazy here. They have a Memory Sluice, tapping some things that are not that proactive here. First one just mills straight up four lands. That's pretty good for us. The second one, though, hits double Creeping Chill. The free spells, man, the free spells knocking us down here. Double Lightning Helix to the face, really putting us under the gun here. Opponent will attack, putting us down to two, giving themselves a window all the way up at the lofty heights of 22. And we have a Bedlam Reveler for turn. Good card, but you know, it's a little slow. Uh, that said, that's still our best hope, so that's what we'll do. We see three cards. It's Lava Spike and two lands. Pretty horrific stuff. Pretty horrendous stuff. We got a bluff here. We got to pretend like we've got like a Lightning Bolt in hand to go with our Lava Dart so we can block really well. Um, opponent doesn't decide to test the waters here with an all-out attack. They're just content to chip in for one with Narc Amoeba. So this does give us a window in which to um, try to stabilize, and I'm not going to blow my Lava Dart on that. Being at one is just the same, basically, as being at two. They do cast another Narc Amoeba from hand, and we just draw another land. So all we can do is crack Fiery Islet, hope for a miracle, and it is an uncastable Surgical Extraction, and that's going to do it. Once again, we get our dreams crushed 
at the finish line by one of Modern's pretty linear decks. Not that we're not a linear deck, to be fair. Not that there's anything wrong with being a linear deck. I don't mind linearity, I just like fair decks to be good too. And, uh, you know, that's basically how it is in Modern, even though it's a little bit skewed toward the green-blue uh, slice of the color pie. Anyway, that's a tangent. We lose. We lose here in three games to a very strong series of crab vine progressions. Uh, their game two one was not so much, but game one is literally as good as you're ever likely to see. And game three was very, very strong. We mulliganed in all three games. We didn't have early graveyard hate in any of the three. And we did kind of flood out here to boot on top of that while being on the back foot to begin with. So... So close yet so far, yet again with Prowess, but man, I love this deck. The results have been awesome. Let's talk about it quick in the wrap-up. All right, guys, so that was another league with Mono Red Prowess for your enjoyment. I do hope you did enjoy it, and I hope uh, you'll let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on the archetype, what your thoughts are on the gameplay, any sideboarding advice, any deck-building advice. Speaking of that... I noticed that this card is extremely in vogue right now with the lists putting up results for the most part. They are running a runaway Steamkin. I'll be honest, this is a card that I didn't really like on paper. And when I was brand new to the deck, I tested it a little bit. But that testing almost shouldn't count because I didn't really know what I was comparing it to, what I was doing so much. I uh, wasn't in a good position to give it a great, rational, thorough evaluation. So I should probably test this out as well, but whether I end up liking Steamkin or liking more Kiln Fiends, I do think maybe upping the threat count by one or possibly two, uh, two drop cards is the way to go. Kiln Fiend, of course, has a better goldfish kill, as we've seen in this league and in others, and Runaway Steamkin grinds a little bit better and facilitates maybe some more... Yeah, they both facilitate interesting turns in different ways. Uh, so that's something that's on my mind. I am also considering making one of these extractions into a second Tormod's Crypt. I think Crypt might be better positioned right now. I also haven't really, like, the Pithing Needle experiment hasn't come up that much, to be fair, but I also haven't really fallen in love with the idea, so this might come out. Let me know if you have any ideas for another 15th uh, card that we could that would be really well positioned right now. I'll be looking at some lists to try to get some uh, some feedback on that. Finally, I am still on the Forked Bolt train. I'm like the only one. I'm like the only one, but this card really facilitates the deck in a way that's very unique in terms of efficiency. It does have some downsides. It does have some... Uh, it is gated by a lower floor than Burst Lightning, but I love the card. I'm going to keep jamming it. I'm going to keep jamming it for the foreseeable future until it really screws me, and even then... Should I really drop it? I don't think so. This card has pulled its weight and then some compared to alternatives. So many spots where, like, tagging the opponent's mana dork, tagging the opponent, and then casting light up the stage all on turn two. Forked Bolt allows that, and that's a beautiful thing. So anyway, guys, there you have it. There you have it. Please subscribe to my channel if you've not already done so. If you're looking for some lovely accessories, including tokens, playmats, and commissions, please check the links in my description for your discount code to brianpalmerart.com. And if you are supporting this content, please, excuse me, that was a little bit of, uh, of a Freudian slip. If you are enjoying this content, please consider supporting it directly. That's what we're going for. Patreon.com slash GrimFlayerMTG. Link is in the description below. Now, the um, scouting reports I write once per month are a Patreon exclusive. They are from the BGX perspective, but even the prowess players, man, you could get a little bit of use out of it, or you could just give back trade value for value. So I truly appreciate everybody doing that. There are other tier rewards for doing so. If you're interested in a donation league sometime down the road, all of your Patreon dollars count toward that. I also have the donation leagues explained on my Patreon page. So, my friends, there you go. Thank you so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the comments section, and I look forward to exploring more Theros spoilers as they come out and bringing you more gameplay and analysis. Talk to you soon. Hope everybody out there has a wonderful night.